Good evening, everyone. Buenas tardes a todos. Welcome to the second annual Alumni Awards for CSUF Latino Communications Institute. This is certainly a lot different than last year, but hey, Titans, we know how to adapt and keep it and keeping it moving. So we know some of you are turn, are tuning in from Orange County, from Los Angeles, and even a few from the East Coast. So thank you to everyone who is with us tonight on this special evening. So here's what you can expect for tonight's agenda. Well, welcome some very special guests have two rounds of opportunity drawings, offer up two rounds of breakout rooms for quality networking and thrill a very special someone with a surprise that they don't know is coming their way. So hang tight for that. All right, everyone, so let's get started. First up, we have Dr. Bei Ling Shaw, Dean of the College of Communications for Cal State Fullerton with a few words to formally open our program. Welcome, Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much, Eric, for getting us started and also for being our MC tonight. It's always so wonderful when our Titans come home and having a member of the LCI family MC tonight just makes this evening extra special. As many of y'all know, the College of Communications at Cal State Fullerton has had a long-standing commitment to advancing democratic society. And we know that true democracy is not possible if all members of society are not empowered to participate in democratic civic engagement. This is why the work of the Latino Communications Institute is central to our work as a college and to our work as a community and frankly, to our work as a nation, a nation that is already diverse, but that needs to be more equitable, more inclusive, and really more actively anti-racist. The Latino Communications Institute, or the LCI as we call it with affection, was founded by past Dean, Dr. William Briggs, who not only had the foresight to set up the LCI, but also had the wisdom to hire Dr. Inez Gonzalez Perez Chica to build it up. The three pillars of the LCI are curriculum, research, and workforce development. But we all know that pillars are pointless without the people who hold them up. Thanks to Dr. Gonzalez, as well as all the faculty, staff, and donors who over the years have given their time, talent, and treasure to building up the LCI, this community today has become a titan familia that our students need at Cal State Fullerton and that our alumni need in the world. We have so many outstanding alumni and of course we're not able to honor everybody this evening. So if your nominee was not selected for this year, I strongly encourage you to re-nominate them for next year's event because we will continue having this family reunion every year. The work toward the vision of the LCI is possible, not only because of the foundation laid by Dean Briggs and Dr. Gonzalez, but also because of the amazing support the LCI has received these past few years from the leaders of Cal State Fullerton, some of whom are here tonight. So I'd like to recognize at this time, our Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Carolyn Thomas, and our Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Tanasin Oseguera. Special thanks also to our college faculty and staff who are here tonight. As of this morning's registration deadline, their names are shown on the slide. Of course, the LCI would not be where it is today without the support of our founding partners, Casanova McCann, Southwest Airlines, and Univision Communications as well as the guidance and support from the members of our advisory board, several of whom are here tonight. Special thanks to Mr. John Ishevestes of La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, Mr. Ron Estrada and Mr. Luis Patino of Univision Communications, Ms. Lydia Martinez of Southwest Airlines, and Ms. Ingrid Sotero Smart of, Cas of Casanova McCann. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'd also like to thank our community sponsors for this evening's program, the Orange County Chapter of the Public Relations Society of America, the Los Angeles Chapter of the Hispanic Public Relations Association, 
and the PBS documentary, Ruben Salazar, Man in the Middle. Last, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, the Museum of Public Relations located in New York City. We'll be hearing directly from the museum later in this hour. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Ms. Jean Guerrero. Y'all already know that Ms. Guerrero is an award-winning investigative journalist and author of the Stephen Miller biography, Hate Monger, which looks at the individual behind the white nationalist agenda of the current administration. Her first book titled Crux, a cross-border memoir, won a Penn Literary Award. Ms. Guerrero is an Emmy-winning border reporter contributing to NPR, the PBS NewsHour, and more. She was also named the 2019 Journalist of the Year by the San Diego chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists for her coverage of the family separations happening at the border long before national media paid any attention to that ongoing crisis. What you may not know from her long list of achievements is that Ms. Guerrero is also deeply committed to helping the next generation of Latinx journalists, authors, and communicators, which is why she agreed to come and speak with us tonight. It truly is my privilege to welcome on behalf of Cal State Fullerton and the Latino Communications Institute, our keynote speaker, Ms. Jean Guerrero. It's such an honor to be here today with the Latino Communications Institute. I'm so impressed with the work that the Institute does and I just wanna say thank you all for, for that critical work. I wanted to start off with some statistics to really highlight why the work that all of you are doing is so incredibly important. More than three in four newsroom workers today are white. 80% of the richest authors in this country are white. Of the highest grossing films in the last decade, 90% were produced by white people. Our, na our nation's storytellers are overwhelmingly white. I truly believe that the resurgence of white supremacy in our society is made possible by the overwhelming whiteness of these industries. Hate mongering against communities of color works only and primarily because our nation's storytellers have been complicit for so long. The lack of representation among people who frame our national narratives is more than a problem for Latinos, Black, and Asian communities. It's a danger to democracy. Americans cannot make informed votes if they don't understand what is happening in their world. And stories about Latinos are presently filtered largely through the white gaze. They dehumanize and caricature us. They miss subtleties and complexities. This isn't always the case, of course. I firmly believe that anyone should be allowed to tell stories about anyone, so long as they've done their due diligence. There are really terrific white reporters who cover communities of color. But the lack of diversity among our nation's storytellers is nevertheless a failure. Until last year, journalists were told not to use the word racist to describe people. That was according to the Associated Press style book, which is a newsroom standard that is used across, across newsrooms in this country. We're always taught to put ourselves in the shoes of white men. We're steeped in narratives in which white male perspectives are dominant and central all our lives. From the time that we're children, the heroes that we're taught to idolize and inhabit are white. That's changing now, thanks to work like yours, but it's changing slowly. I realized this one day after writing my first book, Crux. A friend of mine pointed out that two of my favorite books, which I had displayed prominently on my bookshelf, were written by white men, Moby Dick by Ehrman Melville and East of Eden by John Steinbeck. I loved so many other writers as well, Isabel Allende, Octavio Paz, Maria Rana, ta Coates, Luis Alberto Urrea. But for some reason, I'd chosen to elevate only the books by white men. Our bias favors white men implicitly and always, regardless of the color of our skin, because of the cultural narratives in which we have been steeped from the moment that we're born. As a journalist, I was ta taught to guard against bias, but not white bias. I was taught on the contrary to cultivate white bias. 
I was asked to run background checks on my sources of color, but never the white ones. I was taught to give the benefit of the doubt to my white sources and never the sources of color. When Trump during a round table in the White House said that the people coming into this country are animals, not humans, I tweeted out a video of him saying this and said that he called immigrants animals. I got in trouble with one of my superiors in the newsroom who said I had mischaracterized his statements. My white manager thought it was obvious that Trump had been referring to MS-13 in his comments, even though he did not mention MS-13 in the entire time he was speaking. It's often easier for us to put ourselves in the shoes of people like our president be, more than anyone else because our storytelling industries remain so white. The Associated Press guidelines were finally changed last year to instruct journalists that if someone is actually racist and we have the documents to prove it, we have the actual anecdotes to prove it, then we can call it we can call that action racist. But it took six decades after the signing of the Civil Rights Act for our journalistic institutions, even in progressive newsrooms, to green light calling out racism where it exists. Storytelling needs to become more diverse. It just has to happen for our collective grip on reality. We live in an increasingly post-truth, post-fact world. And it's a crisis that is worsening in our digital era with the proliferation of weaponized disinformation. If we don't have diversity in our storytelling institutions, our nation will disintegrate into chaos and delusion. It's taken me 10 years before I can feel comfortable speaking as frankly as I'm speaking with you now. I wanna encourage you all to feel comfortable speaking out frankly as well and calling out racism and discrimination where you see it. In high school, I read this book called The Devil's Highway by Luis Alberto Urrea, which many of you may be familiar with, about a group of people who, who die at the border trying to reach the United States. It's what made me want to become a journalist. I thought it was amazing that a work of nonfiction could be so charged with emotion, so full of vivid detail and so revelatory. It showed me what journalism could do and that it didn't have to sound like the dry news articles that I was used to reading. It could include Spanish and English words together and it could have a distinct voice. I started my career exactly 10 years ago in 2010. I was an intern for the Wall Street Journal in Los Angeles, and I saw a job posting for a commodities correspondent for the Wall Street Journal in Mexico City. The job posting said it was for people with at least four years of experience in journalism. I had just graduated college. I'd interned at a handful of places, but I definitely didn't have four years of experience. The hiring managers in New York told me to not bother applying. It was out of my league, but I really wanted the job. It called to me for several reasons. My father was born in Mexico City and I dreamt of writing a book about him and learning more about my, my father's family history. Secondly, I loved the idea of being a foreign correspondent, going to, to, to investigate people I otherwise would never know and, and see places I otherwise would never see as, as a journalist rather than as a tourist. So I worked hard at my internship and cultivated a diverse skill set, shooting videos to accompany my print stories, for example. I'd studied print journalism, a major that doesn't even exist at the University of Southern California anymore. And I thought at the time that I was sort of above video journalism. I, I thought I wrongly thought that broadcast writing was a form of, of dumbed down writing. But luckily, my bureau chief encouraged me to make videos for all of my stories, and I'm so glad that he did, because I ended up discovering that writing for broadcast was beneficial for my writing overall. It made me a more concise and authentic storyteller, and it gave my, vo my voice a real, my writing a real voice. I tell you this to encourage you to cultivate a diverse storytelling skill set, even if you have a specialty. My, my videos for the Wall Street Journal helped me to stand out, as did my bilingualism. I applied to that dream job in Mexico City and I got the job. It was a dream come true, allowing me to travel across Mexico and Central America and, get, and to get to know people from all walks of life, coffee smugglers in Guatemala, opium pro poppy producers in Guerrero, Mexico, and women fighting machismo in Oaxaca. 
I was repeatedly drawn to stories about outsiders and outcasts, people on the fringes. I feel that those stories are often microcosms that shed light on systemic and institutional issues. But the largely white corporate headquarters for the Wall Street Journal in New York wanted me to focus on stories that were specifically related to the futures market. They always wanted to know, what does this story have to do with the market? Or, or how is it gonna affect the price of a certain commodity? And if I couldn't answer that question compellingly enough, then I was told to focus on other stories. So as much as I loved that job, I eventually realized it was time to move on. And in 2013, I resigned to write what became Crux, a cross-border memoir. My first book about my quest to understand my father, an immigrant who crosses borders between countries, between madness and sanity, between substance abuse and sobriety. Some people told me I was committing career suicide. I had a dream job as a correspondent at one of the few news publications that still had money to spare. I remember they once accidentally booked me a four bedroom ocean view suite just for myself while covering the G20 summit. But I really believed in the book that I wanted to write and which I'd been thinking about for a very long time. I've been told throughout my life that only accomplished older people can write memoirs, but this is a mindset that is designed to, to protect existing power structures and narratives. I think anyone should tell stories about anything so long as they pour their heart and soul into it. Don't ever listen to anyone who tells you that you're not old enough, not white enough, or not anything enough to do something that you want to do. If you think you can do it, you probably can. I wrote the book and it ended up winning a Penn Literary Award. It went to auction and got published by One World, an imprint of Random House. Back in the US, I got a job at KPBS, the public radio station in San Diego, and I was covering immigration right as the topic blew up in 2015, just a few months before Trump announced his candidacy. Leading up to the election, I was covering the record deportations that we were seeing under the Obama administration, interviewing men rejected by two countries in the sewers of Tijuana, documenting aggressive police raids of their encampments. I trekked through smuggling routes at the US-Mexico border with a group called Aguilas del Desierto, a group of volunteers who go out to rescue dying migrants and to recover their remains. Each time I went out to the desert with them, we came across human dead bodies. This was incredibly disturbing, particularly knowing that this is a problem that has been going on since I was in high school when I read that book by Luis Alberto Urrea. Then Trump announced his candidacy, talking about Mexican criminals and rapists. It didn't feel possible to me that Trump could win, that anyone could win who used that language. I recognize now that this is because I personally didn't realize how deep the racism in the United States goes. I'm a white passing Latina with some white passing privilege. Even as the daughter of a Mexican immigrant and a Puerto Rican mother who faced discrimination all their lives, I was in many ways spared from the same ugliness as my parents because of their hard work. I received a private education and I speak English fluently without an accent. It wasn't until very recently that people have begun telling me th things like go back to Mexico and other racist tropes. My last name and high profile and my work on shedding light on white supremacy has brought the white supremacists out of the shadows. But none of this is actually new. Trump's rhetoric is not an aberration that came from nowhere. Those of us who grew up in California in the 90s remember the intense bipartisan anti-immigrant hostility of that decade in this state. The Republican governor, Pete Wilson, blamed all of the state's fiscal problems on immigrants and there were statewide bipartisan attacks on the Latinx community, attacks on affirmative action, on bilingual education and on social services for immigrants. I remember th there was this sense of shame associated with being Mexican and, and you know, Latin American families bragging about European ancestors. And this was because of this internalized white supremacy from the, from the narratives that were being beamed across the state. My mom, who's Puerto Rican, used to tell me, you're American, you're not Mexican, you're not Puerto Rican, 
you're American. Looking back, I realized she wanted to give me a sense of belonging, which she as a Puerto Rican woman in a white male dominated profession, the medical field did not have. My mom's a doctor and people used to discriminate against her because of her, her Puerto Rican accent. And she didn't want that to happen to me. But eventually I realized as did my mom and so many other Latin American families in California that you can be American without renouncing your roots. And this is why I ended up reporting out of Mexico for four years and, and really you know, focusing on shedding light on these issues. You can be American and Mexican and Puerto Rican and anything else. I truly believe that the horrible polarization that we are seeing in our society today, today where there seems to be a breakdown in people's ability to talk to one another can only be reversed by you. The more diversity we have in our storytelling industries, the less that black and white things will, the less that things will seem black and white to people. White supremacists like to paint multiculturalism as a threat to civilization, but the only thing that it's a threat to is extremism. The more multicultural we become as a nation and the more diverse our institutions, the more we improve our collective capacity for empathizing with multiple ways of being. The more diverse stories we tell, the more we improve our collective imagination. Your voices are so important. Sometimes it's hard as storytellers to feel that our work is really making a difference. Unlike doctors who help people get better when they're sick or attorneys who win a lot of money for their clients. It's sometimes hard for people in media to see that what they're doing actually matters. I recently had the fortune of seeing a concrete impact as a result of my work. You know, Border Patrol put out this fictionalized video of an immigrant murdering a man with a knife and they used false crime statistics in the video to paint immigrants as a violent threat. I fact checked the statistics and wrote an article. Within hours, they had removed their video. Journalism still matters. What we've learned in the past few years is that storytelling actually matters more than anything else and determines almost everything else. The stories we tell determine where resources go, who makes money, what policies are made, what people believe or worry about, or how they treat each other. The impact we have is real. Humans are a storytelling species. In the book Sapiens, Yuval Noah Harari explains that what distinguished humans from all of the rest of the animals in this world is our ability to organize and mobilize around stories. Our storytelling ability is what made us as powerful as we are. When the El Paso shooter went into the Walmart last August and massacred 23 people, his actions were largely determined by false st stories that he had internalized about Latinos, that they're invaders, criminals, welfare guzzlers. Representation matters because it ensures that false stories like this get rooted out and exposed for what they are. It is so important that you not get discouraged from what you're doing amidst the resurgence of white supremacy. There's this concept in psychology called learned helplessness. Scientists were doing experiments on dogs and they found that if you subject dogs to electric shocks in a situation where they cannot escape, they eventually stop trying, even after you change the circumstances to allow them to escape. The past few years and this year especially have been exhausting for people. The crises just keep coming. We've learned helplessness. Wouldn't it sometimes be easier to just quit to stop caring and just go through the motions and do the bare minimum that our employers currently require of us. I've certainly felt that fatigue and that desire to give up, you know, especially while reporting my second book, a biography of Trump's senior advisor and speech, speech writer, Stephen Miller, called Hate Monger, Stephen Miller, Donald Trump and the white nationalist agenda. But this learned helplessness can be reversed. I draw strength and, and healing from communities like yours. There is power and connection and knowing that together we can make a real difference. That is why it's so important for you to come together like you do at this institute. So, so many, so most of you probably have hyphenated identities and come from a diverse background. Maybe you're a first generation immigrant or a second generation or third generation. 
Either way, you have this special ability to move between worlds, between countries. And this is an incredible asset. It is the root of all wisdom. Think about how the human brain works. Our brains are divided into two hemispheres and they communicate through a tangle of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. It's a bridge. Our two brain hemispheres would not be able to coordinate their activity without that bridge. The philosopher Julian Jaynes believes that early human brains were not fully integrated through the corpus callosum. Thoughts in one hemisphere were perceived by the other hemisphere as the voices of gods. It wasn't until the hemisphere is fully integrated that we stopped hallucinating and were able to perceive our internal dialogue for what it was, our own thoughts. That's how we gained free will. You are the bridge between the two extremes of America, the bridge that will allow America to become whole and unified again. You're the bridge that will heal the present state of separation and division. You will help America recover her sanity. Stephen Miller, the subject of my latest book, is an extremist. He sounds exactly the same today as he did when he was a teenager because he was radicalized at a very young age. He, he was indoctrinated in a radical ideology to the point where he could not hear the other side anymore. He went on to become the most powerful advisor in the White House. He writes Trump's speeches and immigration policies and consistently pushes him in a more aggressive and incendiary direction. His radicalization started with listening to Rush Limbaugh and other conservative commentators as a teenager who became more and more radicalized as the years went on. Right-wing extremists have been innov innovating with the media since the 90s. Neo-Nazis have been spreading their ideas online on places like 4chan, American Renaissance, and other platforms. Conservative commentators have learned how to cloak racist ideas in the language of heritage and national security in order to make it palatable to people. This started in, Cal in California in the 90s with people like Tucker Carlson, who grew up in Southern California, and like Miller, the subject of my book. They painted multiculturalism as an existential threat to civilization. They introduced false crime statistics and other white supremacist propaganda into the national consciousness. They exploited fears about the browning of the nation. History is repeating itself. The state of California in the 90s was a microcosm for what we're seeing in America today. Apocalyptic language around racial issues was born in California. It's quintessentially Californian where our cultural fetish for dystopia and apocalypse is born and bred in Hollywood. Extremists also use apocalyptic language because it is so effective to incite fear. In my book, I show how Stephen Miller's mentor gave him a strategy paper that talked about the need for the Republican Party to remake itself around inciting fear instead of hope. But the fact is, hope is a stronger emotion than fear. Hope is what sustains us. It's what keeps us alive. It's what keeps us fighting in this era of crises, economic and public health crises that we're experiencing, where so many people are dying and struggling to make a living. Hope is what people are looking for. We are the descendants of people who know how to weave hope out of nothing. Immigration is a manifestation and an act of hope. We have learned how to give one another hope. Right-wing extremism is a growing threat, threat that is being deliberately fueled by people in power today. Right-wing extremists are responsible for 90% of extremist related plots and attacks in the United States. But you would never know it from listening to this administration, which focuses on vilifying Black Lives Matter and anti-fascists. The climate of hostility towards people seeking justice in the United States is beginning to remind me of the climate towards those people in the most struggling parts of Mexico where I reported from, where it is not safe to be a journalist because of institutional corruption. Dozens of journalists have been killed since the 90s in Mexico. And one of them was my friend Mando Montaño. I met Mando when I was an intern in the Seattle Times during my sophomore year in college. We kept in touch over the years. And when he learned I'd gotten a job in Mexico City, he asked me for help applying to an Associated Press internship in Mexico City. 
He was a couple years younger than me. He got the internship and asked me where to live and I recommended my building in, in La Condesa, a nice neighborhood in Mexico City where a lot, of, a lot of expats live. I showed him around Mexico. His mom was worried about, about you know, him being a reporter in Mexico and, and he told her, don't worry, you know, I'm with Jean. She's a responsible person. One night he came over and we talked about how that weekend we were going to be covering the 2012 Mexican presidential elections. The next morning, I found out that he was dead. He was found asphyxiated in an elevator shaft a few buildings down from where we lived. The case remains unsolved, but the memory of Mondo lives on. He inspired so many journalists with his aliveness and drive and enthusiasm. He was such a great journalist with such a unique voice. I dedicated hate monger to him because of what his bravery and friendship meant to me. It's because of him that I had the courage to quit my job in 2013 to write my first book. He had faith in me and encouraged me to take the leap shortly before he was killed. And he believed in the dangers of demonization and never using specific instances to try to demonize a whole place or, or a whole people. As I watch what is happening with the vilification of journalists and the media in the Trump administration, when I watch unmarked fans snatching up anti-racist protesters in Portland, I think of what happened to Mondo. Trump likes to hate monger against Mexico and Mexicans, but he is remaking this country's government in the image of Mexico's weakest links. In my book, Hatemonger, I show how Stephen Miller was crucial for Trump's victory in 2016, in large part by lying to Americans. Some people have questioned my ability to approach the subject of Miller from an unbiased perspective due to my Latina heritage. They suggested that I, write, wrote, that I set out to write a hit piece because I'm Mexican and Puerto Rican. That's irrational. The fact is my family history gives me a better understanding of Miller who like me and like many of you is the descendant of people who came to this country seeking a better life, like everyone who is a part of this country. We need more stories told through the filter of our gaze so we can build a more perfect union. We need to use true words to describe people in positions of power, words like racist or hate monger or whatever is the factual case to help people understand the true threat of hate speech. And I do think that we are headed in that direction. The case of California is instructive. In the 90s, after the statewide white backlash against immigrants, Latinos mobilized and turned the state deep blue. The state became increasingly mixed and multicultural, and the strengths of diversity became recognized for the strengths that they actually represent. Neo-Nazis and white supremacist views were once more relegated to the fringes of California. Nationally, I think we're going through the same experience, the same growing pains as California did in the 90s. But as our nation becomes more diverse, more people will have hyphenated identities. And as a result, a greater capacity for empathy and identification with multiple ways of being. There will be less tribalism. And you are the ones who will bring that to the table. You are the bridge that will make America sane again. You will make America healthy again. And you will make America whole again. Thank you. Jean, thank you very much for that speech. Um, this is not part of the program, but I would like for all of us to take a moment of silence in honor of Mondo. Gene, my deepest condolences, our deepest condolences for Mondo. May his work and legacy continue to live on through your work and everyone else's work. Thank you for everything that you've done for shedding light on such important topics that are crucial to, to, to not only rights, but, but the life of an individual, the life of a human and 
And I really agree that storytelling needs to be more diverse in order to get a better grip of reality. Another round of applause, please, for our keynote speaker, Dean. All right, everyone. So our next guest speaker is someone very special to me personally and to a lot of LCs in the virtual house tonight. She has already been introduced by Dr. Shaw and as the founding director of the Latino Communications Institute. And the LCI is why we are here tonight. Es la razón por que todos nosotros estamos aquí esta noche reunidos to continue to build a community of support for the LCI, the alumni, the students of the program, otherwise known as the LCs. Now, she serves as the executive director of Maná de San Diego, a national Latina organization that empowers its members through education, leadership development, community service, and advocacy. Ladies and gentlemen, damas y caballeros, please welcome Dr. Inés González Pérez Chica. Thank you, Eric. It's great to see you. It's great to uh, see um, everyone. And um, wonderful speech, Jean uh, Guerrero. Thank you so much for sharing that. I can't wait to read your book. So good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to join you at the second annual LCI Awards Night. Thank you, Dean Shaw, for inviting me. I was asked by the Dean to share some of the LCI accomplishments. In over six years, the LCI has worked with over 200 students. Many of the students are now thriving professionals. Only a few years out of college, they already have achieved a degree of social upward mobility for themselves and even for their families. These young professionals are also now the mentors to the LCI students. Peer mentoring is at the core of the LCI success. And I want to thank the LCI alumni who continue to stay involved, who inspire students by just sharing their own story and who continue to take on the responsibility to pay it forward. If you can see it, you can be it. The LCI alumni have shown us that LCs can work as journalists in the second largest media market in the nation, that if you work smart, you can make 70,000 two years after graduating with a PR degree, that you can go to Harvard to get your master's after your two years in Africa with a Peace Corp that you can move to China and start a life as an expat working in PR, that you can move to Washington DC, to Chicago, to New York, and any town in Texas and start your career there. These are all true stories of LCI alumni. I am honored and grateful that I know these stories and that I'm able to follow the careers of so many LCs. This is what I learned from leading the LCI. A college diploma doesn't guarantee an entryway to a career. It is a diploma, it, it is a diploma plus social capital that ensures career success. And for first generation college students, it's essential that they learn to build social capital. The LCI represents social capital for its members. There is an old proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That is what the LCI has been all about. Showing first generation college students how to build community. The last thing I'll say is directed to the LCI alumni. Thank you for continuing to keep this community strong. You are the motor that runs the LCI engine. 
It doesn't matter who the next LCI director is. I ask you tonight to make a commitment to keep your community strong. Thank you and good night. Thank you very much, Inez. Another round of applause. Thank you so much for everything. You have really impacted the lives of many, muchos de nosotros. Uh, many of us are first generation, second generation uh, with immigrant parents. And um, I've said it once, I've said it twice. Um, my parents taught me how to luchar, right? My parents taught me how to, how to be resilient and not give up, but Inez, and the Latino Communications Institute taught me how to luchar, how to be resilient in the professional world. So thank you very much to Inez for that. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> Moving on with our program. Um, once again, thank you very much Inez for everything that you've done for the Latino Communications Institute. And as I mentioned at the top of our program, this is our second annual event for the LCI Alumni Award. So let's throw it back and acknowledge winners from our inaugural event last year. First, we have Brenda Saucedo, the innovator. Next up, Denise. Next up, we have Denise Salcedo, the visionary. And finally, Cheryl Desir, outstanding mentor. Thank you to last year's winners and for continuing to make a difference and for all that you do for all of the students. Thank you very much. You've seen and heard about the impact of the Latino Communications Institute. So let's hear from the LCs themselves. My name is Caroline Salinas. I'm part of the LCI class of 2019. I'm the co-founder of Our Vibes Media. And I'm so thankful for LCI for connecting me with such valuable internship opportunities during school. It gave me the experience and the knowledge I'm proud to have today. LCI allowed me to present the best version of myself at the NHJ conference because I often practiced my elevator speech, brushed up my resume, and had strong referrals to land that first job right out of college. Hello everyone, my name is Andrea Casillas and I am a rising second year at Cal State Fullerton and I'm a part of the graduating class of 2023. I joined LCI about a year ago and it has helped me grow professionally and personally and has helped me network with a lot of professionals in the industry. I'll forever be grateful for my second family that I have at Cal State Fullerton. Hey everybody, my name is Marcos Mora. I'm a graduate from the class of 2019 and I was a member of the LCI for three years of my undergrad. The LCI benefited me in that it allowed me to meet important people and make important connections that helped me land my dream job. Round of applause, please, round of applause. Thank you to all of those uh, LCs and for sharing your testimonial. It really goes to show what we are, who we are, and who we plan to be as well as we move forward together as this LC Familia. Well, that really sets the tone to meet this year's awardee, so let's get to it. Let me share the nomination criteria first. You must be a CSUF alumni or current student who embodies the spirit of the Latino Communications Institute. You must be committed to opening the door for collaboration, provides mentorship and support to Latinx talent in the communications industry and proactively seeks opportunities for involvement. And now it's time for our four, first awardee. Can I get a drum roll, please? None other than Inez Gonzalez Perez Chica. Round of applause, please, everyone. Alrighty, Inez. So we're gonna let you collect your thoughts a little bit and we're gonna read an excerpt from your nomination. Inez was and still continues to be a huge part of the Latino Communications Institute. Inez made strides 
making the institution what it is today by creating partnerships that still see the vision and continue to willingly be a resource for the LCI, even in her absence. Inez has been a beacon of hope and light during their entire, during their entire time at CSUF and has brought countless opportunities to students using their own connections. The LCI has always been seen as a close-knit familia, while we are not all in close proximity. If we ever need anything, we know we would be there for one another. Round of applause again, please, for Ines Gonzalez Perez Chica. Thank you. I guess I get to say a few more words. I really have said everything I wanted to say, so I really appreciate this. My last day at work, it was during COVID. No one was there on campus. The campus was closed, so it was anticlimactic. So it's really great to see everyone. And I, I'm just really lucky because I, I have stayed in touch with the students that I created relationships with. And so I'm here for you. I love getting that call when you get the promotion, when you apply for the master's, when you get to Harvard, all of these things. I just love it, so keep calling me and bothering me because it's great. Thank you so much. Inez, muy bien merecido. Thank you so much for everything. You guys, she had no idea, so this was a complete surprise for her. Um, you've inspired so many of us, Inez, and we hope to continue the legacy and the pride of the Latino Communications Institute because of you, por ti. Felicidades. Congratulations, Ines. All right. So now we move on to our second awardee of the night. Can I get another drum roll, please, everyone? Drum roll. Sabrina Baez, graduation year 2014, freelance writer and event specialist in China. Congratulations, Sabrina. Let me read an excerpt from her nomination. Sabrina moved to China in 2018 and continues to make strides in her career. At the beginning of COVID-19, everyone was dealing with separation anxiety, but Sabrina was one of the few LCs who kept everyone motivated. Even with the time difference, Sabrina continued to support us and didn't rush anything to get back to her own work. Sabrina is now freelancing, but really what we admire is that even though Sabrina graduated, this person continues to take the lessons Ines has instilled within the Latino Communications Institute and has used them to her advantage. Even giving talks on social capital, what it means and why it is important. Sabrina is now learning Mandarin and, can see, and you can see her creating a life in China. Let's take a look. everyone, I am Sabrina Baez and I am honored to be one of the awardees of this year's The LCI Awards Night. It truly is a pleasure to be nominated and to be awarded this incredible honor as a member of the LCI community since it was first founded back in 2014. I truly encourage everybody to please give back and to also take the time to mentor, whether you are a student helping another student or whether you're an alumni helping another alumni or another a current student as well. I truly believe the LCI laid a foundation for me during my career as a public relations and marketing professional in California and now in my upcoming marketing and public relations career in China. Thank you so much for this incredible honor. Gracias and xie Bye. Sabrina, xie to you and for everything you have done for the Latino Communications Institute. Another round of applause, please, everyone, for Sabrina Valles. No sé si está aquí o tal vez she's sleeping out there because of, of the time zone, right? <laughs> All right, we are moving on to our third awardee of the evening. Drum roll, please. 
Lucille Villa, graduation year 2011 designer editor at the Washington Post. And the excerpt from his nomination states, Lucio has been a great mentor to a recent LC graduate who moved across the country for the first time. When Dominic Torres moved to Washington, DC, shortly after graduating, Lucio welcomed him to the city with open arms and was kind enough to host Dominic at his home while he settled in the city. Not only did Lucio provide Dominic with the mentorship of an experienced professional but Lucio was kind enough to even advise Dominic on a place to get his hair cut. It's very important. Keep that hair great. <laughs> In addition to being a great mentor, Lucio is proactive about recruiting LCs for opportunities at the Washington Post. He has reached out to several LCs multiple times with job internship opportunities and makes himself available for questions. Recently, Lucio was promoted to a management role at the Washington Post as one of the few Latinx editors. Let's take a listen with a few words from Lucia. Thank you for the recognition. I used to not like being in the spotlight, but have learned the importance of sharing my accomplishments. I never saw myself as an editor for one of the largest newspapers in the country. And that's because of not seeing people who look like me in these roles. This is why I'm okay being in the spotlight now to show Latino journalists and students that it is possible and why I continue to stay involved with the LCI. But that's just again, LCI for this award. Hello everyone and good evening. Buenas noches desde la otra costa. I'm coming to you from Florida up on the East Coast. My name is Deb Prieto Green and I'm on the board of advisors for the Museum of Public Relations based in New York City. And I'm here to present your fourth awardee. So we're gonna switch it up just a little bit and you're gonna see why in a second. So this evening's final awardee with a little drum roll is... Eric Resendiz, graduation year 2016, journalist at KABQ TV. I know many of you know Eric, but here's a little bit of uh, the excerpt from his nomination. Eric is a real visionary and is a vital part of the LCI. Amongst his peers, he's described as a go-getter and an influencer. He's a community person who continues to lift as he climbs. Eric not only embodies what it means to be an LCI member, but he's recognized by the CSUF Capital Campaign as a titan of promise and is said to inspire many alumni and students in all categories, but especially amongst the Latinx students. The CSUF Office of Alumni Engagement said Eric was one of our modern celebrities, comparing him to Gwen Stefani, Kevin Costner, and Roy Choi. He's always supported the LCI and he's a big advocate of it, coming to the majority of LCI events. Eric is someone who still loves to connect with others and someone who you can count on. Congratulations, Eric. Thank you very much. I appreciate um, the award. Uh, I'm accepting the award, the SPO Award, a can of hair spray, but that while it arrives to me. Uh, but it really means a lot to me. Um, and I dedicated to all of the LCI alums before me, ¿verdad? Porque gracias a ellos, thanks to them, we are where we are today because of their hard work, their esfuerzo. Um, so this is dedicated to all of the alums that came before me and to all of my mentors as well, right? Um, through uh, my life uh, as growing to be as a professional and before I was, and when I was a student, I learned that right? There are people out there that want to help people, right? But they also expect those that they're helping for once they've made it, once, once they've accomplished things to pay it forward. So thank you to all of my mentors who taught me how to be a good mentee, but also how to be a good mentor as well. Um, and those are just some words of wisdom as well for um, all future communication specialists here who are a part of the LCI. Your future's looking bright. Thank you everyone for this award. I really appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone.
Congratulations, Eric. Look, I think what you mentioned about being a mentor and being able to pay it forward is really what we're about. Um, every year for Hispanic Heritage Month, the Museum of Public Relations sponsors a special event to host to honor um, Latinx PR professionals who have made a difference in our industry. The event is sponsored through the National His Hispanic Public Relations Association, which is special in particular to Cal State Fullerton because one of your own alumni, Mr. John Echeveste, was one of the founding members for the association. This year, we're going to have our event. It's a little different. It will be held virtually on September 24th. So I encourage you to join us for that event, especially because Dr. Ines Gonzalez is going to participate this year as one of our panelists. So thank you for having me here this evening. The Museum of Public Relations is really proud to partner with Cal State Fullerton and the Latino Communications Institute to support and promote the next generation of Latinx communications talent. Gracias. Thank you, Deb. I'm so grateful to have the Museum of Public Relations be our presenting sponsor tonight. Thanks also to the executive director of the museum, Shelly Spector, for always looking out for the next generation of communications professionals. Congratulations again to all our winners this year, joining us from different time zones, including the East Coast and China. And special thanks to Eric again for being our MC tonight. Let's close by giving a huge round of applause to all the winners. And thank you to the fabulous tech team at Titan TV, Iraj Shadaram and Nathan Jeffers. And finally, huge thank you to all the volunteers who put this event together, whose names are being shown right now. Last, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your presence at this evening's event. We're now going to close the formal program. And while the presenter Zoom room closes, Andrea, who is the LCI student assistant this year, will be assisted by our associate dean, Dr. Deanna Leone, to announce the winners of our first round of opportunity drawings. After that, we'll break up into the first of our informal networking sessions. The first session will last about 45 minutes then we'll come back together for another opportunity drawing, and then we'll break out into our second informal networking session. So I will see you all in the breakout rooms and take it away, Andrea. Thank you everyone for being here tonight.